it's a genuine pleasure and an honor to have Professor Terry Jordan Pitchcock talk to us today. Terry's a special person, a special scholar, very special colleague, and a friend. He is a true son of Texas, uh, raised in Dallas, did his undergraduate work at Southern Methodist University, did his master's degree here in this department before going on to the University of Wisconsin, where he took his PhD in 1965. But even though he was in Wisconsin, he still did research on a te Texas topic, German settlement. After graduation, Terry taught for a few years at Arizona State University, and then returned home to Texas and taught at what is now the University of North Texas, but for years it was North Texas State University. But he joined the faculty here in the Department of Geography at the University of Texas 20 years ago. He holds the Walter Prescott Webb Chair in History and Ideas. In the true spirit of Walter Prescott Webb, who was a historian, but one with a very strong geographical focus, Terry's a cultural historical geographer and one with many ideas. I can't tell you how many times during the course of the past 20 years in various conversations with Terry about various geographers or about various aspects of geography, I would hear Terry make a comment like, well, he doesn't do my kind of geography, or, well, that's not my kind of geography. As we discussed in this course so far this semester, there are many geographies. And there are many geographers doing different types of geography. Well, today, Terry is going to tell us about his kind of geography. The title of his presentation is My Kind of Geography, <laughs> Cultural Geography and Postmodern. That's not true. That's not in the that title. That's the title you gave me. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Terry Jordan. Actually, I, I chose the title of my um, little essay in order to facilitate a double purpose. My kind of geography allows me both to address some general thoughts and concerns and opinions that I have about our discipline at large, taking stock at what is by any criteria a point near the end of my career. The same title also upon allows me to elaborate upon my own particular and unique way of doing geography, my kind in the narrower sense. Now, I'm a bit befuddled by old age, and I'm not going to try to keep those two purposes segregated within the essay, but instead let you try to figure them out yourself. Geophilia, my religion. The very first thing I want you to know about uh, my kind of geography, broadly or narrowly presented, is that it functions as my religion. Now you think a lot of the time in this paper I'm going to be kidding, but most of the time I'm not. I am a geophilist. No other religion I have ever heard of interests me in the slightest. Planet Earth is the only heaven in the universe. Gaia is the one and only goddess of geotheism. No gods at all exist. And Gaia herself may not even be real. Geotheism is either monotheistic or non-theistic. I will never know. I'm probably the world's only geotheist. 
at least the way I define it, in my kind of geo-religion. <clears throat> For me, geotheism satisfies all the spiritual and aesthetic and emotional and mystical and intellectual needs that I expect from a religion. And that's true even if Gaia doesn't exist. She has never once, by the way, spoken to me. And I have never asked her any questions. If Gaia does not exist, she certainly uh, does not, if she does exist, she certainly doesn't seem to have things on planet Earth quite as fully under control as James Lovelock and some others imagine. No matter. Clay-footed divinities remain the best kind. Moreover, Gaia leaves you pretty much alone. And that is a prime virtue for any deity. She does not engage in all that finger-pointing anger that I find so annoying in male shepherd gods in flowing robes, or rule-making gods who send bureaucrats and merchants to be their messengers, scribes, now it is true that she did repeatedly say, but without much emotion, my way or extinction. But hey, she was probably telling the truth. She didn't say that to me. But. Best of all, Gaia lacks that nasty compulsion to carve instructions on stone tablets and get angry right away when you ignore them. She may well be illiterate. In fact, she does not even care what happens to us. And I like that. With smile. I mean this. I have been allowed to study geography for nearly 60 years. Since 1945, to be precise. And to teach it, beginning as a laboratory instructor in climatology, for almost 45 years. That has been my enormous, boundless privilege. Far more than any human being deserves. An afterlife or some on some silly, fluffy cloud or chasing nubile women around a paradisical garden, that's not for me. Geotheism remains entirely rooted in the real world. At least my kind does. Join my religion if you want to. But I'm perfectly happy alone, and I do not seek converts. Other than my dearly beloved Bella, evil communists long ago made it difficult for her to do so. But deep down, I think she has a lot to do with my geotheism. A whole lot. Besides, I, we, want to run this church. and you might interfere. Martin Luther got this whole drift of things going a long time ago. He's one of my heroes. Geotheism does permit Sunday heroes, sundry heroes, but no saints. When I was only seven, you must now allow me an autobiographical indulgence. Without it, nothing else, I have to say, will make any sense. I do not exaggerate much at all when I say my initial geotheistic stirrings came at the age of only seven. Not that I was some sort of progeny or wunderkind, far from it. I was in most respects just a pretty ordinary kid playing cowboys and Indians and kill German soldiers and touch football with the other children living along Milton Avenue in Dallas or more accurately University Park, Texas. About that same time I learned some rudiments of fist fighting but I'm going to leave those out here. They are related and will be in the book. So, a pretty ordinary kid. What I did possess by age seven was a precocious curiosity about the world. 
and a genuine desire to travel. These set me apart and stirred my initial geotheistic zephyrs in my young brain. It was the fateful, I didn't know it was, it was the fateful month of August 1945 when I turned seven. <coughs> World War II had just ended. For some time, my parents had been planning a trip. Peace brought an end to gasoline rationing. It allowed rubber tires and other automobile parts back on the market. It opened tourist courts which had been shuttered tight. The nation's highways, though battered a bit, remained drivable. A family could hit the road. We Jordans did. My geophysism experienced its conception, though all things considered not a very immaculate one. The Nazis' human incinerators all over Central Europe still cooled from their grotesque activity. Nagasaki and Hiroshima dissipated a different radioactive warmth. Even the exceptional heat of the Texas summer lost a bit of its grip. Now remember, I was only seven. I can't recall paying any attention to the misfortunes of the Japanese or Europeans. Gaia herself sort of let that nuclear bomb thing slip right through her clay grip. My problem. No, I faced a greater and more immediate concern. One which if badly handled could have killed both my kind of geography and geotheism itself. My problem lay in the fact that my parents, who had chosen it as a destination, that nirvana of all true Texans, Colorado, <laughs> contemplated leaving me behind with my grandparents on a farm in the cotton fields and piney woods of East Texas. They imagined I was too young to appreciate such a journey. True, I had never crossed the border of Texas, nor had I ventured more than 250 miles from my home. But I really wanted to go on that trip. I used up all of the very small quota of whining and weeping allowed persons of my age in those times minimal and possibly even negative effect. I adopted another strategy. I had large ears figuratively. And listening to snippets of parental conversations and radio newscasts, I had accumulated some geo facts, enough to pretend to be a pretty worldly little fellow. At the dinner table, our main conversation venue, I began popping questions. Hey, how come the Philippines belong to us when they're all the way across on the other side of the ocean? Well, this launched my parlor socialist father into a diatribe completely incomprehensible to me at the time, against colonialism and the exploitation. But he did it in response to my question. Or, do the mountains in Colorado really reach three miles straight up? Wow, that must be a sight to see. Or, did you catch those pictures of Indians in the National Geographic? They were really interesting. Questions and remarks like that. My parents silently began exchanging glances. They were evaluating the travel situation again. Still, they faced a major logistical and financial constraint. 
my father's teaching at SNU remained below the $3,200 a year he had made in 1932 when the school simply cut all wages in half instead of firing half the faculty. Two, our family automobile, which was a jet black four-door 1937 Dodge sedan, was going to be crowded if I came along. Due to the money problems, we've been obliged to invite an aunt and uncle, mercifully childless, to accompany us to Colorado, sharing expenses. My sister, 15, would come too. But to their everlasting credit, my parents were relented. I would be allowed to go to Colorado. Had they not been so compassionate, or failed to see my exuberance, my kind of geography might never have come into existence. Today happens to be my mother's 96th birthday. Thanks, Mom. You're the one who really made that decision about going to Colorado. Now it's disappeared. I want the scrapbook that has a right there. I want to prove this. And now somebody else, well meaning, has removed all of the tabs from the book. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Right? Colorado. No, that's not it. Why do people do this to me? There. Baby book. Okay? <laughs> Pass it around. Two pictures. Sedan. Lots of people. <laughs> Get it right back to me because I have another one I want to show. And if she hadn't done that, then the world's first and only geotheistic church at University Park, Texas, would be still there. I would probably be plodding along as a Methodist, the denomination of my religiously lethargic redneck ancestors. <laughs> a fine church, to be sure, for many fine deeds, like destroying native cultures in the South Pacific Bible Belt. But in the final analysis, boring. I do love their music, though. <laughs> the natural. Some, perhaps even many people, certainly include me, are geographers by nature. Birth, DNA, instinct, inclination, whatever you want to call it. The discipline permeates our very bones. That doesn't mean you cannot be a good geographer if you lack these innate attributes. But I imagine you get on track later if you're made instead of born to it. We natural geographers possess, sometimes even by the age of seven, a built-in curiosity. Look at all those people, all in that one car. <laughs> a built-in curiosity about places, and regions, and natural habitats different from our own. We think territorially and spatially. That's how our biological species spread so rapidly across the earth to inhabit virtually every possible niche. That's why I so desperately wanted to go to Colorado or anywhere else. They might have chosen. I possess that curiosity. Heck, I would have gone to Iowa or Mississippi <laughs> happily. Shoot, I've been to Mississippi voluntarily three times just within the past year and a half. <laughs> Max. Over the years, I developed a few litmus tests to identify fellow natural geographers, not that that's really so important. 
but the principle one involves maps. If a map, a map of any kind, truly fascinates you, then you're a natural. I read maps before I could read words, poring over them and asking a hundred questions. My poor sister eventually grew so exasperated that she gave me her own little apples just to keep me from sneaking into her room and taking it from her bookshelf. I still own that battered old red book. Geotheism is a religion with a book, the best book. Natural geographers really don't need to be taught how to use maps and atlases. We just naturally understand what they are and why they exist. I would say that by maybe the age of five or six at the latest, I was already drawing maps. I need that back real quick now. <laughs> to judge from specimens collected from my baby book, this is a map. It's more than that. It's a map of my front yard. And it's also a picture of a cultural landscape. And it's not like all those other dorky houses that kids draw. It looks exactly like our house in our yard. The sidewalk curves where it's supposed to curve. It's a map of our front yard. And sometimes I had others. Sometimes I would try to copy the shape of the state of Texas. Or I would draw maps on different ways to get to my friend's house who lived just down the block. And that was before I was reading. It even says on one of those pages, what does it say there? Four years old. <laughs> wow. He drew the bloody map when he was four years old. That's a natural. I still own most of the oil company maps we used on that trip to Colorado. locked in my office downstairs right now. Each of those precious relic maps is marked with green lines made out of what we used to call airplane, model airplane dope, which is the stuff I got highest on in my life, I want to tell you. <laughs> it was green. I was making a green airplane and the lines on the map are all green airplane dope but they show exactly where we went through five different states and I drew those lines myself when I was only seven. On to Colorado. In fact, I stood on my feet in that 1937 Dodge nearly all the way to and from Colorado. Even through that corner of Kansas we went, which is something like Iowa. My favorite place was on the front bench seat. It wouldn't allow you to do that today. Directly between my uncle and my father. Only slightly less favored was the place directly behind that seat on the rear floorboard. My elbow is resting atop the woolen upholstered seat back and my feet slightly boosted by the lump or mound on the floor through which some sort of cables or machinery pass, which I've never understood, not being mechanical. Right. And all the while, my eyes swept the horizon. I wanted to be the one who discovered things. Darkish Capulin Mountain, though I didn't know its name, extinct but almost fully intact volcano in eastern New Mexico. That was the first high ground I had ever seen in my life. And it caught my eye before anyone else's. But my crowning achievement involved noticing something odd about an elongated, stationary, distant white cloud beyond Capulet. Are those clouds, I said? Or are those the snowy mountains you told me about? 
after that side of the Sangre de Cristos, which I didn't also know what to call, I was hooked for sure. Weep John Wesley for my lost geophysic soul. Now I belong to John Wesley Powell instead. The geographer and everyone. Now we can make way too much of this natural thing. To one degree or another, geography lies in every one of us. It's a part of being human. Beyond the places we've seen and explored, always lies the unknown, including some truly mysterious and exotic lands. We often tend to populate these regions with our fantasies and fears. Dragons festoon old maps of corners of Gaia's domain. But familiar places play a crucial role too. All places possess an emotional significance that contributes profoundly to our, our identity as individual human beings. We all must belong somewhere to be complete persons. At least in my kind of geography, we do. Geography, as I would discover, is an outgrowth of both our curiosity about places other than our own and a need to come to grips with the place-centered element within our very spirit and soul. Paradox alert. Now there's a paradox at work here. Geography is at once everywhere, nearby places with familiar sounding names, and those faraway places with strange sounding names. It's a subject matter literally surrounding and enveloping us while permeating our inner being. And yet, when you try to find geography as an academic discipline, it's like giant gulliver in search of Lilliput. The undergraduate or graduate major in geography resembles a very small town or a hamlet. It's not even marked on many maps. Finding it is a, it's difficult as stumbling into Shangri-La, Ultima Thule, Seven cities of Sipova. I got lucky. I really got lucky. I found geography easily. It wasn't just that I got to go to Colorado. They actually taught some geography in the public schools when I went to Dallas. I remember map drawing assignments including one involving Iberia in, say, like the fourth grade. And we used to make those wonderful terrain maps on pieces of thick cardboard out of some concoction of salt and flour and food color. Now, geography had already been folded into the social studies by that time in those neat old world geography textbooks of the 1920s and earlier were gone. We did have back issues of the National Geographic magazine in the school library. In any case, my family had subscribed for decades. Most of my buddies poured through those looking for sex education and finding it. But I can honestly say that as a late bloomer, I went for the geography. Then I got lucky again. I found the geography in my very first semester at Southern Methodist University. My kindly guide through the secret passes to this blessed shrine of geotheism was Professor Edwin J. Foskey. A charismatic and dynamic teacher who seemed to me had been literally everywhere. Thank Gaia I found my way so early and so easily to wise sister geography, as the famous Russian scholar Leo Gumilev 
fellow geographer, by the way, told me, I cannot imagine what my life might otherwise have become. Kinds of geography. Once you enter our discipline, the realization soon dawns upon you that many different kinds of geography exist. You can even improvise your own, unique to you. Yifu Tuan did that. So did Ann Buttermer and Gumalef and Bill Bungie and Hendrik Van Loon and Michael Jordan, Ellen Simple, Bill Doolittle. Sure did. J.B. Jackson, the Little Prince, or at least he found one. Alexander von Humboldt, Mona Dumash. Robin Dowdy, Carl Sauer, John Rooney, hundreds if not thousands of others. Most geographers do. Most. Maybe you will too. Get busy. Well, so did I. Mine is no better or worse than the other kind but it belongs to me. Never claim superiority for your own kind of geography. To do so is rude, and it might bring down the entire enterprise to its knees. Anyway, I work mine out exactly the way I like it, but I'm not going to tell you about it just yet. Other things need saying first. Do not expect, in the face of all these kinds and types, for geographers to speak with one voice. We have never done so, and we never will. That is not our way. Diversity remains our most enduring strength, refuge, and weakness. Sometimes our Battle-like, even cacophonous voices turn deans and university presidents into stone, as surely as Medusa in her prime. The great majority of non-geographers have no clue what we really do. But when they read what we write, they usually like it. Geography has always lacked structure. We have been the Hindus of the academy. Even untouchable Harijans by the standards of Harvard and Yale. Worshiping a thousand gods. Unconcerned with internal inconsistencies and contradictions. Freedom. In short, the different kinds of geography allow a freedom based in individual choice. Perhaps our discipline exists mainly for mavericks, for unbranded people. We chafe at authority, at established methodologies, methodologies, and at orthodoxies. Such freedom demands self-confidence and just a wee bit of arrogance. Truth, no meaningful rules exist in our discipline. This implies that you should not waste your time seeking a definition of my kind of geography or any other. So of course I'm going to give you mine, eventually. But trust me, it's a fool's error, even to try. As a geographer, you are free to study just about anything your heart desires. I have observed members of our geography faculty right here at the University of Texas alone over the years 
grow raptures about graveyards or eucalyptus. I have seen them paint rocks different colors high on a mountain and go back later to see where the fickle forces of nature move them. I have seen one add water to millennia-old fossil pack rat feces, reconstituting them and extracting pollen to reconstruct past climates and vegetation recoveries. I have seen them study in incredible detail satellite images from outer space. I have seen them watch birds frolic beside sewage treatment ponds. I have seen them wonder at ancient religion and myths of Glastonbury. I have seen them work as veterinarians in Afghanistan. Often we did so at some considerable bodily risk while enduring physical hardships. I even got dysentery myself once, though my geotheistic inclinations run toward personal comforts and hedonism. And make no mistake, that kind of research regularly leads to solid, meaningful results. Doing our different kinds of geography in this department, we have achieved the highest rate of book publication of any doctoral granting department in our discipline. Stephen Hall and Francisco Pettis those rock painters and pollen extractors are two of the finest physical geographers in the country. Our program in cultural geography ranked in the type the best in North America. And this work attained recognition beyond geography. My old buddy Hall took early retirement. He now makes as much or more money as a consultant living in Santa Fe. As he did teaching here at UT. Clearly, the freedom offered by geography contains a magic elixir. We are no frivolous bunch of devilers, but instead solid, productive scholars enjoying international respect across disciplinary lines. I have a section here says, wait, we do need a definition after all, but that's that's for external consumption. So that's the sort of thing Dr. Knapp has to do to protect us. Maybe the little part called less party would interest you. The definition problem rears its ugly headed in formal social gatherings, as you all know. Pesky party goers are forever coming up to you and saying something like, so you major in slash teach geography. That sounds interesting. Is it sort of like geology? <laughs> what exactly do geographers do? You should, of course, dumb down your definition for such people. Make one up and dumb it down. Keep your answer short. Don't tell the truth. <laughs> Possible be a tad arrogant about it. <coughs> they will less likely pursue the topic if you can tweak a sense of inadequacy in it. <laughs> Frankly, I don't go to parties to talk about my work. Neither should they. It's boring. <laughs> and they can't do us any harm. They're not deans. <laughs> Though one or two might become one. And yes, we need some rules too. But they're not the kind of rules you think. Another price to pay for freedom. The Office of Homeland Defense wants this from us. Unlike the definitions, the rules are required for internal use within geography. And they are truly essential to the maintenance of freedom in many kinds of geography including mine. So if by sheer good luck you find your way into this blessed veil of our strange discipline, 
you really must accept and uphold a code of ethical and polite behavior when dealing with other geographers. All too often we fail at this. The cardinal rule is that you respect all kinds of geography. Never try to restrict our freedoms. Never seek to impose censorship or orthodoxies upon your fellow geographers. Push no exclusivist agendas. Engage in no intellectual evangelism. Do not under any circumstances proselytize for your particular kind of geography. And whatever you do, take no measures that might divide physical from human geography. We simply must not allow that to happen. That would finish us off as a discipline. And yet I see abundant evidence that we are allowing this to happen. These are the two principal kinds of geography. They underlie all the others. And they form a symbiosis. Now we perhaps imagine that cultural ecology is sufficiently powerful to bind the two, as it has in the past. But it's not. The joints are crumbling. idea bouncing. Do, on the other hand, by all means, bounce ideas off your fellow geographers, both physical and human. We desperately need such exchanges. That helps preserve both the discipline as a whole and your kind of geography from stagnation. One of the greatest threats we face is that lacking a clear focus and definition, we will let even the smaller kinds of geography bleed away into neighboring, more specialized fields of learning. It happens all the time. Usually, one by one, people just drift out of our valley unless we talk to them. Oh yes, I know, we take in new refugees in exchange. Some of you may be refugees. But we lose too many of our own. The Russian geographer Gumilov said it best. Our discipline combines, quote, the river of holistic knowledge, diverted long ago by many into the irrigation ditches of specialized disciplines. We must work against those powerful separating currents. Balance your ideas gently, like skipping flat rocks across a still pond. Do not be arrogant and throw them at the skulls of geographers who pursue different types. Your kind of geography is not better than anyone else's. This code of ethics extends to both the living and the dead. Do not discard the geographers of the past. I think I can correctly say I have always learned something useful and valuable when I read something by a geographer, living or dead. This is one of our greatest strengths and it is one thing that causes us to be different from most other disciplines who wad up and throw away their used scholars. <coughs> Retain the past. Protect our heritage. This, too, is the proper inclusionist thing to do. Yes, you can embrace fans. Draw them into the fold. But do not be faddish to the point where you begin disparaging or discarding what is not fashionable. No, don't let shoddy work pass without criticism, but confine your comments to the quality and not the kind or type of geography that's involved.
geo Nazis. Now, simple and unburdensome as these modest rules and restrictions are, they really place almost no meaningful burden on any of us. It seems that not everybody wants to obey them. More often than we would like, evangelizers and zealots stray among us. Invariably, these intellectual fascists or ideologues seek to remold us and push their kind of geography at the expense of ours. We often attach the word determinist to them, and fittingly so. They come wearing all kinds of stripes. And perhaps few among them realize that they are potential destroyers. Or maybe they do. And they're simply so insecure about their kind of geography that they feel the need for a herd mentality. Regardless how totalitarian their behavior, we can always learn something from these people, and they from us, if they choose. We should not respond to their attempted pogroms with one's aim to destroy them. Their attempts invariably fail anyway, and useful residue remains behind. My first encounter with geo-Nazis came in the 1960s. What they informed us, among other things, was that regional geography had died. The cause and justification for its passing was its, quote, purely descriptive nature, end quote. Nothing could have been less true. It had not died nor had it ever been anything even remotely approaching remotely descriptive. I'm not sorry, purely descriptive. They must not have read that most magnificent of regional geographies ever written in the English language. Ellen Churchill Simple's The Geography of the Mediterranean Region. Somehow they had missed Dan Stanislavski's The Individuality of Portugal. Why they hadn't even seen Ed Foscue and Langdon White's textbook, The Regional Geography of Anglo-America. Those books are not devoid of explanation. These particular accusers were economic determinists. We who did not agree with them had better jump on their quantitative theoretical bandwagon right now or we were going to be tossed in the dustbin. They had dragged a lot of ideas in from other disciplines, supposedly superior to our own. And there's nothing wrong with interdisciplinary exchange, so long as its intent is not destructive. These modernists, another name they went by, tried to make of us the givers of spatial laws and advocates of socioeconomic determinism. Well, they got one bounced idea from the pen of gentle Ann Buttimer that they certainly noticed. She said, and did, that we should expect more depth from geography than, quote, the dance macabre of materially motivated robots. After that, some modernists lost much of their fervor. Very nearly melting down like the Wicked Witch of the West in Oz. A handful even recanted, though we did not ask them to. They regretted trying to steal the romance from geography. They were sorry they had forgotten the names of all those faraway places and regions with strange sounding names. A bit earlier, Carl Sauer 
and sent the same message as Anne. Over at Texas A&M where we had a seminar and he was there, he was asked by a graduate student about Walter Christaller's central place theory, a network of explaining why cities and towns are where they are. A very early example of the quantitative theoretical revolution back to the 30s. Well, Sauer took a long draw on his ever-present pipe and he replied, bees, as I see it, build honeycombs. People don't. See, Central Place Network is set up in hexagons. Now, that's not the same thing as if Sauer had said, dump Crystal, but we had nothing to learn from him. That's not what he said at all. Quite the contrary. He and Ann showed with these comments exactly how to skip an idea across a still pond without injuring the recipient's skull. Carl and Ann had made their comments as humanists. All they really said was, Geography has room for both the sciences and the humanities. Quit throwing rocks at our heads. So as it turned out, regional geography didn't die after all. Turns out the Soviet Union, history, God, time, Western civilization faced greater mortal danger. I don't want to take a break. Postmodernists. You'll want to hear about that. Everybody wants to hear about postmodernists. The next group of geo Nazis, actually geo Marxists to be more accurate, <coughs> to kick on our door with steel tipped jackboots, call themselves postmodernists. Many modernists had quickly metamorphosized into this. And why not? If they did not, the modernists, know the whole truth through their kind of geography, then the truth must be unattainable and beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. Actually, though, geography, my kind at least, has always been postmodernist in spirit. Ours is a discipline eclectic of content and people by a motley assembly of nonconformists, rebels, drifters, flakes, rejects, and anarchists. We geographers, polyphonic and in internal discourse, anticipate a benign form of postmodernism. Perhaps we even unknowingly invented it. We geographers are not the sort to file patents. At the very least, to use a term from the cultural ecologists among us, we were pre-adapted to be postmodernists by our habitual disciplinary chaos. Geography has experienced continual flux for over two centuries, and it has never set, solidified, or gelled. Were our chosen field a river, it would be a braided stream with small channels wandering across a flat plain. parting, rejoining endlessly. I live on one of those braids, the smallest one, but it has never run dry. Or maybe geography instead is a sprawling, huge, very thinly populated river delta. 
I'll let Paul Hudson, our fine young fluvial geomorphologist, decide that. If it is in fact a delta, then I reside in a small fisher shack atop a levee. Do you need some structure? <clears throat> Distributaries and braided channels don't offer much constancy. They provide a little of the stuff of definitions. If you feel a need in your soul for structure in your intellectual endeavors, then you are probably not a geographer. Cheer up. There are far worse fates, though offhand I cannot imagine one. <laughs> but you may have come to the wrong discipline. Clear channels of flow can be had in almost every other academic field. Go to archaeology. You will find yourself in a 20 meter square duck pit, checkered off by white strings, pouring contaminated dirt through sieves. Until you get tenure. Go to physics. They'll let you roll steel balls down, down inclined planes, cramming any deviations from the norm into artificial perfection through the, what they so quaintly call chaos theory. Or go to biology, where they will tie you down with the myriad lines of the Linnaean classification so fast. Like Gulliver and Lilliput, you'll never know what hit you. Anthropologists will tell you you must be a scientist. History will place you in an archive to grow pasty-faced and hemorrhoidic. <laughs> Geology will often repel you into a genuine canyon where there are meanders incised and channels fixed. Go one or another of those disciplinary routes, and you must obey and conform. Freedom will have flown. Not that channelization and structure possess inherent evil. For most people, guidelines provide comfort and security. But that is not the way of geography. An intellectual genealogy. Oh, come on. First, they ask for an indulgence for an autobiographical diversion. <coughs> And now I'm demanding one for genealogy. Well, it's essential to the story. I don't hear Gaia complaining, and why should you? I cannot get to my specific kind of geography any other way. It's my church, and I do not pass around the collection plate. At first, the confession is in order though we don't really allow confessions in geotheism. I did not invent my specific kind of geography. Rather, I merely cobbled it together like a half-crazed tinker from pre-existing raw materials. I am basically a junkyard dog. But in so doing, I relied upon my intellectual genealogy. We all, of course, possess a genetic-based family history full of ancestors who pass on to us DNA, genes, chromosomes, and other good stuff, and some harmful stuff. And that's important. If, as I suggested earlier, many geographers are born rather than made, then it, it's really important. But we ought also, every one of us, to try to piece together our intellectual genealogy. It's more important. Where did your ideas come from? And mine. 
usually one finds this infinitely more difficult to figure out than who your great-grandparents were. Because ideas just float around and split change in ways that defy float source printed by the Mormon church. To reach the equivalent level of Adam and Eve, on my intellectual genealogy. I would have to begin with the Enlightenment. Big deal, you say. That's true of all of us. Yes, remember, we're still at the level of Adam and Eve. The underlying Enlightenment idea here is that if we will release our minds from religious and other superstitions, and observe what we can perceive of the earth with our five senses, we can learn some substantial measure of the truth. It has to do with imagination, objectivity, creativity, individualism, and of course, freedom. The cornerstone of the entire edifice rests on the belief that first-hand observation is the greatest potential source of truth. In my kind of geography, this translates into field research. Now, this is my way, not necessarily yours. Much fine geography has been done from armchairs. I don't reject that approach. It's just not for me. I have traveled and done formal or informal field observation in 65 different countries, one for each year of my life. My field notebooks fill a substantial section of the beautiful library in our home. You'll find the most incredibly diverse things in these binder manuscripts. I call them my dork books. Data for 15 or more scholarly published books reside in along with a travel journal, postcards, and some incredibly intimate things about Bella and me. Keep your nose out of my dork books. That's why Bella and I keep them at home, away from snoopers. Well, uh, you can look at some parts of them. Sometimes I'll just sketch the plan of a village and some of the things in it. my dork book called, quote, The Genuine Dork Book, Russia Field Notes, May, June, 2000. I write under the known diploma, Bimby, by the way, always. Here, for example, is a map of the far western Russian village named Vazina. It's map splattered with dead mosquitoes that I fixed in place with scotch tape. <laughs> Besides, each is a spatter of my own blood, which they had drawn. But that book has some serious content, too. After marrying Bella, I labored mightily to understand her beloved mother, Russia. Suddenly, one day, seated on a park bench in the provincial Russian city of Yaroslavl, Surrounded by dandelions, enlightenment came. I whipped out the dark book and on the spot wrote a little essay. I call it Russians Love Dandelions, and I'm going to read it to you. Even a common wildflower 
tells us something about a culture. We have all seen dandelions, those hardy little yellow flowers that sprout as weeds in lawns and produce a fluff ball of seeds. In America and Europe, gardeners wage eternal war on dandelions, working hard to dig them up and poison them herbicide. <coughs> to the Western eye, dandelions spoil the uniform grassy expanse of a lawn or a park. They intrude unpleasantly in a garden of vegetables or domestic flowers. Except the children who delight in blowing seed puffs on each other. Dandelions are enemies of Western people. Not so in Russia. In city parks and in around rural vacation homes, dandelions grow in profusion in May and June. Instead of tidy, neatly mowed lawns and carefully planted flower gardens, Russians prefer a natural look. To the Western eye, everything in Russia seems neglected and weedy. But to the Russian eye, this ragged expanse of dandelions and other weeds is both beautiful and desirable. An American, or particularly German, strolling through a city park in Russia will be seized by the desire to run a weed whacker over the whole thing. <laughs> not the Russian. And it is not that they are lazy or slovenly. They simply prefer more natural, less artificial surroundings. Perhaps we Westerners fear nature and seek it even in trivial ways to tame and overwhelm it, to announce our victory over the physical environment. Maybe that's why we hate dandelions. Perhaps Russians, at the end of their long, severe winter, rejoice when nature revives and green growth renews and little yellow flowers bloom. And that's why they love dandelions. Perhaps dandelions can teach us something worth knowing about a foreign culture and about our own. Well, anyway, that's why field observation is part of my kind of geography. The first split in my intellectual genealogy led me to the field rather than the armchair from the Enlightenment. Alexander von Humboldt showed me the way. Another parting of the ways. The Enlightenment impacted both the sciences and the humanities. Another forking of the intellectual genealogy occurred. I headed straight for the humanities. Something sinister was afoot in the sciences that caused sensitive souls like mine to recoil. It was the early industrial revolution and exploitive capitalism. The Scottish poet Bobby Burns, out for a wee bit of field research himself, visited a steel foundry, saw what was amiss, promptly wrote a poem. I came not here to view your works in hopes to be mere wise, but only lest I gain to hell it may be no surprise. Now, I didn't reject scientists from Humboldt in the process. You don't have to. But once I opted for the humanities, then came another split in the intellectual genealogy path. I could either try to employ the humanistic perspective to fix what was wrong following a utopian socialist path, or I could retreat into romanticism and escapism. My father had faced exactly that same choice. 
he a professor of classical German literature. Honestly, though, neither of us ever really believed the world could be fixed. We remained parlor socialists. Oh, yes, my father voted for Norman Thomas in 1936. But deep down, we knew socialism and utopianism would not be his path or mine. My kind of geography cannot fix anything. I am an escapist. You can fix the world, man. not me. Romanticism. I didn't just become a romantic escapist. I chose again, largely also because of my father, the most extreme form, the German type. Some say the most dangerous type. The Nazis, I mean the real Nazis, made some rather nasty use of it, this German romanticism. Bouncing along to Wagner's music. No idea is inherently harmless. Well, all forms of Romanticism do share certain characteristics. Romanticism favors the bucolic, the rural, over the city and industries. It emphasizes an idealized past and tends to reject the present or the future. A dangerous stripe of anti-scientism discolors it. Farming and farmers and peasants provide much of the subject matter. And the word folk pops up with sometimes annoying frequency. It also emphasizes field work. You need to think of the Brothers Grimm out in the dark forests of Germany collecting folk tales. But at least we stayed out of laboratories and did not build hydrogen bombs. No. We're poets at heart in my kind of geography. Does this mean I'm a hypocrite? Living as I do in a city, enjoying the benefits of urban university life, employing countless devices and fruits of science? Of course it does! Geotheism permits, even encourages hypocrisy. Hedonism too. Gaius says not one word against them. Why be masochistic? when I had no intention of fixing the world. Silly question. Go stand in the corner of the room. And guess which geographers I met away along the way to this hypocritical romantic escapism. People like Ellen Semple, Carl Sauer, and Clarissa Kimber. August Meitzen and Sally Horn and Fred Niffen and John Bruns and Heston Evans. Gee whiz, how many others? Hypocrites all. The good companions for eternity. Now my father had taught me to read German fluently. And influential teachers like Don Brand and John Bergman directed me to the relevant literature in geography in that language. In shaping my kind of geography, no single book proved more influential than August Meitzen's four-volume analysis of the cultural landscape, the built folk habitat of Central Europe. Meitzen's photograph is one of relatively few to hang on the wall of my faculty office. Cultural landscapes. Meitzen helps put it all together for you. You probably never heard of it. Just as he did for Sal, for Niffen. For decades, he journeyed through the countryside, carefully recording for detailed field notes, the types of the houses, the barns, the fences, 
the layout of villages, field patterns, and the like. The folk house, he declared, possessed, quote, the embodiment of a people's very soul. And, quote, we walk in every village among the ruins of antiquity. End quote. The traditional built environment, the folk cultural landscape, can, if properly analyzed, be read as surely as a book. It possesses an enormous explanatory and diagnostic ability. And that's quite aside from its aesthetic appeal. Niffen applied this powerful concept to the North American folk landscape. My kind of geography bears his imprint, too. Truth resides in these landscapes. At least enough of it to keep me busy. So there it is in a nutshell. My kind of geography. My kind of religion. My intellectual genealogy. Mixed more than a equal measures of the Enlightenment quest for truth, hypocrisy, humanistic focus, first-hand field observation, romanticism, poetry, morality, orientation to the past, escapism, shape well, and my alchemy is complete. Not fixing the world. Well, my kind of geography didn't exactly save the world. It can't cure my own cancer. But neither can those fine doctors and scientists who follow the other paths out of the enlightenment. Moreover, I'm extraordinarily proud of what I did achieve in my kind of geography. Let me tell you about my greatest pride and joy. The book I feel is my best of all. First, my kind of geography involves more than a fair measure of serendipity. In the middle 1960s, I started looking at notched log buildings in Texas and the United States. I did so initially because I found them aesthetically pleasing. They seem to me to be poetry and wood. One thing led to another, and 20 years later, I was looking all over Central and Northern Europe for the prototypes of what I had seen in Texas and the United States. And then one fine day in Scandinavia, there it was. One remarkable detail, unduplicatable, of wooden construction that occurred only in the small borderland between Sweden and Norway and in the eastern United States. Big deal, you say. Well, yes, it turned out to be a big deal. Because from that one diagnostic cultural landscape clue, a type of notched joint, I went on to figure out to my own satisfaction the origin and evolution of an entire system of backwoods forest colonization that allowed the American settlement frontier to sweep across the forested eastern half of our country so rapidly and effectively between 1700 and 1825 as to build our nation. My bucolic cultural landscape had given me probably the only original idea I ever had. Usually my kind of geography doesn't get that lucky. More normally, one remains content with the poetry and the aesthetics. Now that book won several prizes, I'm happy to say. It's frequently cited by anthropologists and 
even archaeologists. But what I'm proudest of about it, I have lost the page, is that it kept together physical and cultural geography. You cannot have a forest colonization system any other way. It preserved, indeed rested upon, that holistic principle of, principle of our discipline, which in my view is most essential, keeping together physical and human geography. Globalism, schmogalism. I know you want to hear about that too. So how does my specific kind of geography cope with globalism? After all, I've heard for a long time that geography is dead or dying because of it. Ed Ralph told us a long time ago about placelessness. Sooner or later, it's going to kill us. Alas, alack. Well, I've certainly learned something from globalists. No doubt about it, the world is a less diverse place than former. We need to listen to these people. Don't bounce rocks off their skull. But I do smell a new determinism here. Economic determinism. Rolled out again in different clothing. The point is, less diversity does not necessarily or even likely lead to no diversity. And the entire economic system driving globalism is very fragile. It could kick into reverse at any moment. There is no way the entire world can be brought to an American standard of living or way of life. The resource base is just not adequate to do that. Think about it. Besides, I look around and see things happening that directly oppose globalization. One little electrical glitch. And in a moment, the greater part of the northeastern United States disappears like North Korea from the nighttime image of the planet. One carefully planned terrorist attack two largest buildings in New York City vanish forever. Buildings not a little bit associated with globalization. It's all so fragile, so dependent upon law and order, so breakable. If globalization is inevitable, Then why are the Israelis building that massive defensive wall along and often across their border with the Palestinian West Bank? And how can one innocent looking Arab young lady manage to kill 19 people in an Israeli restaurant?
And how does a tiger suddenly maul an illusionist very nearly to death on the Las Vegas stage? Maybe the far greater part of globalization is an illusion about to get really mauled. Anyway, I've heard it all before. In 1929, Zionist leader Max Nordau declared that he and his friends, quote, intend to go to Palestine, Palestine, too much protection, <laughs> as the emissaries of civilization and extend the boundaries of Europe to the banks of the Euphrates. Well, today we have another bunch of fools trying to implant Western civilization on the banks of the Euphrates in the names of globalization, or neo-colonialism, or greed, or revenge, or ignorance, or whatever. And by the way, it is all right to bounce rocks off of skulls of non-geographers any time you want to. <laughs> Especially if they use their bookshelves for baseball souvenirs. <laughs> anyway, this latest bunch of globalizationists that loosen that part of the world don't seem to be having much success either, nor were the medieval crusaders who started the whole dubious business in that part of the world. Yes, of course globalization has an impact, but its reach far exceeds its grasp, and the road bears two-way traffic, and it ignores culture. No, in my kind of geography, I believe in a mosaic. Maybe the tiles are bigger than they were in olden times, in classical mosaics. The better to crush skulls with, my dears. But it's still a mosaic, this world of ours. That's why I call my textbook The Human Mosaic. My co-author, Mona Damash, pursues her own kind of geography. Not much like mine. She likes the title too. No kind of geography is dying. Only individual geographers do. And that's the main reason applied geography survives and thrives. And by the way, my kind of geography heartily approves of the applied aspect of our discipline. If globalization were really happening, Many of those applied jobs just wouldn't exist. Applied geography depends upon a diverse world. And so my little essay ends. I am, because of a lifetime practicing my kind of geography, to borrow and paraphrase Algeus Huxley, Today, quote, poor by exploded convictions and perished certainties, but far richer with my variant of Kumalev's wise sister geography. Perhaps long ago, I, like Huxley, set out on my career in life, I believe I was seven knowing how people should best live and be governed and believe. But when one travels with geography, my kind at least, such convictions get mislaid as easily as eyeglasses. Unlike eyeglasses, those certainties are not easily replaced. Nor should they be. There are no certainties in geography. No matter what kind of geography we choose, you and I should inhabit this new millennium without needing certainties 
without professing to have too many answers, without telling and particularly without forcing other people how to live. They won't listen in any case. My kind of geography, really all kinds of geography, do not ask them to. Why would they, in any case, listen to a bunch of flakes like us? Thank you, Terry. I trust you'll entertain some questions. Yes, uh, I don't know whether I'll entertain them, but I'll, I'll try to answer them. But then how can you answer questions when you don't have any answers? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you have a question? Yes. You, you said, always have a question. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's just because you spoke with 100% certainty. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll be the devil's advocate here. And you said that there's no idea that is 100% harmless. So, what about the idea of democracy? Are there any exceptions? Yes. Democracy can lead to license and excess, if not used with restraint. Democracy can be taken to excess like anything else. Liberty can become license. There must be some law and order. Democracy taken to its logical end product abolishes law and order. But then it's anarchism, it's not democracy. Well, that's true. Democracy logically leads to anarchism. Just as the Protestant Reformation logically leads to one church for each person. And capitalism leads to total monopoly. If unfit. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll ask a question that maybe the answer is equally as easy. But of all the places you've traveled, is there any one place that stands out as being your favorite? And why? A place I would go to live tomorrow in preference to Texas? Yes. I like Australia a whole lot, though. Texas and the United States. I like it as a whole. But I particularly like uh, Sydney, New South Wales. On a smaller scale, uh, I like the southern half of South Island, New Zealand, even better than Australia. And I like these places for a variety of reasons, which could get into a long conversation except that I find there are people far less uptight about things, far more ecologically minded, far more responsive to the need for common good, far less selfish, far more humorous, far more hedonistic, far less religious. Those are the few that <laughs> And I had a chance to have a tenure track job at Canterbury University, Christchurch, New Zealand in 1969. And like a bloody idiot, I turned it down. <laughs> but I probably had a happier life here. Wow. It's another one of those forks in the road. Not in your intellectual path there, but in or Robert Frost in sense. <laughs> this comes under um, questions pertaining to religion. What was the first religious question asked? Lice. <laughs> 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 
did it come as a result of seeing a religious act, service, or hearing a conversation on the subject? Blank. <laughs> when did he first ask about God? <laughs> Blank. <laughs> did describe any religious interest, problem, or question which arose before three years of age? Blank. Between three and five? Blank. Between five and seven? Blank. I tried. She didn't know the answer. Yes, that's true. Guess who's teaching the course in geography? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure if I had such a book, it would be also zero, 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 because I would go to the Soviet Union. They didn't have that page in your book. <laughs> we didn't know the word. Well, I bet you could nail them with dialectics, couldn't you? <laughs> I'm one of those where people who had to not just read, but take notes of all four volumes of this capital, because that was required when I studied economics in the Soviet Union. And it took us years. But this, by the way, is published by the Mother's Aid of the Chicago Lying in Hospital Association. My mother lay in the hospital for two and a half weeks before she was allowed to go home with me, and I was perfectly healthy, seven and a half pounds. They do write this book, paste in cards up here. But there's also about. I know, but I don't know. <laughs> she wrote a lot of stuff in there. So did my father. Lying in association. <laughs> that sounds like my kind of shocker. <laughs> now I know why we stopped at every logs building in Europe. When I was a kid. Yeah. He's been sense. through a lot of this. Why That's my son, Eric. Back then. And his wife, Shannon. My son, Eric, is a seventh generation Texan, and I think Shannon must be a 25th generation Texan. <laughs> And they came oh. here each to push on one side in case it started going like this. See, I wasn't a born geographer because we got stopped at these cult museums and <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to go to the next town. So. Well, not everybody is, son. Right. I, I'm not holding that against you. Thank you. <laughs> You're very young, too. <laughs> at the end, um, in your closing statement, you said that um, your kind of geography doesn't approve of applied geography. Said I do approve of it. You do approve of it. Don't ever. That's cool. Very good. That's why I asked the question. Bad, bad. He's already in the corner or you would go there. <laughs> I heartily approve of it. it. My point was it thrives precisely because of the diversity that globalism is supposed to be crushing. Diversity generates applied geography. Why shouldn't we be doing a thought geography? It's a logical thing to do. What conceivably could my kind of geography have against it? I don't have anything against any kind of geography. Gaia doesn't either. She's not going to get you a job. Your skill will get you a job. Don't build altars and things. Don't need to. We used to have to build those altars to get jobs in geography. You don't have to do it anymore. That inherently is good right there. But as you go about your applied geography, don't forget your unapplied geography because they're two very valuable parts, two very valuable kinds. The one feeds your intellect and the other fills your pockets and hopefully you can get them to do both. But you need both. You, to be a liberally educated person, you need different kinds of geography. It's, they're not mutually exclusive. No, I only disapprove of George W. Bush. <laughs> I even like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Warren Beatty would run for president. <laughs> Did you 
you, do you think that as a graduate student, you have the opportunity often to study your kind of geography, or do you find that often you are forced to some, study someone else's kind of geography? I don't think you can necessarily form your own kind of geography until you have studied other people's kind of geography. I think you should sample as widely as possible. But ultimately, you're free to do whatever you want to. Take your ideas, build your intellectual genealogy, keep more and more strands going through there, and it'll be an easier thing to do. No, I, I learned. I say I tinkered this together. If I hadn't read those books and studied with those professors, I'd gone to Colorado. Could have been in mind. Listen to everybody. Everybody on this faculty has something to say. Everybody among you has something to say. Let's skim those ideas. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Skip, skip, skip. Chatter all the time. That's the way it works. I didn't let you chatter today because I was being put on tape. I was constrained. I was overly formal. Don't get the wrong impression. But now I've got the tape. Can you give me a copy of that? <laughs> Absolutely. Keep an open mind about everything. There's not anybody in this department you can't learn from. Or other departments too. As they say, bring in fads, ideas from other disciplines. Just be careful how you do it. It's, it's a lot easier to convey an idea generally. It's much more constructive. Other questions? Well, again, Karen.